Thank you for joining us at the first, uh, hopefully, annual Believer's Reason Conference here at Newburgh Christian Church. My name is Ken Cook, and I'll be moderating the first debate for you. So today, the uh, thesis for our debate is the story of Jesus is cut from the same story as other ancient mythologies. Mr. Barker will be taking the affirmative, and Dr. White will be taking the negative. Uh, James White is the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, a Christian apologetics organization based in Phoenix, Arizona. He's a professor having taught Greek and systematic theology and various topics in the fields of apologetics. He has authored or contributed to more than 20 books, including the King James Only Controversy, The Forgotten Trinity, The, the Potter's Freedom, and The God Who Justifies. He is an accomplished debater, engaging in more than 75 moderated debates. Please welcome Dr. James White. We have also have with us Dan Barker, who is the co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the author of the recently published book, Godless. For your information, we have a coffee shop open in the back, and there is also a table full of books for you to purchase from the, all of the authors who are speaking today. Uh, the format for the debate is in your program on the first side. Uh, Mr. Barker will be opening. If you have questions for the question and answer time, please turn them in at the book table, and they will be sorted through. Uh, the only additional change to this schedule is that there will be a five minute break between Dr. White's closing and the audience questions. Thank you for, for your time, and Mr. Barkin, you may begin. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, James. Good to see you again. I can see James and I are in the same denomination. We both have Max, <laughs> and we are hoping to convert the rest of you by the end of today's, the rest of you uh, troglodytes, we're still using that old system, and thank you Newburgh Christian, what is it, Newburgh Christian Church, and thank you all for coming, and I was going to start off today by saying that I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, because my name's Dan, but that's an old joke, but it turns out I was milling around in the back up, and there's a whole lot of non-believers here as well as believers, and I think humanists of Portland, and my brother Daryl, and my dad down here, came down from Olympia area, he's got the hat on that says, uh, <laughs> what does your hat say? Oh, it says, out of the closet atheist. There you go. Okay. <laughs> and uh, some others who drove from away, so thank you so much for coming in, and I have to say that Ken and the staff here have been very warm and friendly and generous and welcoming, and it's a real pleasure to be in a group like this. I'm not an expert, you can start now. I'm not an expert in ancient mythology. I'm a former preacher who is still preaching, I guess. And this field of ancient mythology is very deep and very wide. It's a fountain flowing deep and wide. But in my reading, I noticed that the experts in the field often disagree. The scholars of paganism, as well as the scholars of Christianity, are sometimes locked in fierce debates. And I think that is healthy. That's how we learn things. There are very few claims about ancient history that have a high level of certainty. Like all scientists, historians have to work with probabilities. We do have documents, we have monuments, but it is all interpretation. And just as with Christian theology, interpretations vary. I made up my own story, my own myth. Once upon a time, there were three little donkeys. One of the donkeys built his house out of paper. One of them built his house out of sticks. The other one built his house out of bricks. Then along came a big, bad elephant. And he huffed and he puffed and he blew down the house of paper and he got a match and he burned down the house of sticks. But he couldn't break down the house of bricks. So he came back with a bulldozer and he demolished the house of bricks. Well, I'll spell you the rest of the gruesome story, but what did I base my story on? The three little pigs. How did you know that? Did I mention the three little pigs? Did I copy the story exactly? How did you know it was the three little pigs? Because I'm appealing to your cultural knowledge when I write a story like that. Suppose a historian 2,000 years from now would discover my story, not knowing about the three little pigs, 
and the possible political symbolism of donkeys and elephants. How would that historian interpret my story? She might doubt that a donkey could build a house, just to some doubt that Balaam's ass could talk, or that there was actually a snake in the garden who could talk. But that's beside the point. She would want to know the purpose and the message of my story. And suppose she would discover the Three Little Pigs story, would she say, aha, Dan Barton is a thief, he plagiarized. Suppose she discovered, oh, donkeys and elephants. Suppose she realized, oh, back then, oh, okay, I can see what Dan was trying to say. She would understand that I wasn't plagiarizing, I wasn't stealing. She would understand that I was building on an earlier form in order to create my own work of art, my own story that I think is a, a better story. Maybe you disagree with that. There's a difference between imitation and emulation. A story like Christianity doesn't have to exactly parallel or mirror every little detail of the pre-existing pagan stories in order to be seen as a copy or emulation of the earlier myths. In fact, we expect it not to be identical. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a new religion. The new religion is trying to outdo the previous stories. So they have differences. All religions are unique. Christianity, Judaism, Mormonism is unique, Scientology, Islam, Rastafarianism, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is certainly a unique religion. Have some of you here today? But the uniqueness is in the modern details. All of these religions evolved from earlier traditions, and that's especially true of Christianity. Last summer, Annie Lori and I were in New York City, and we went to see West Side Story. We love that musical. The fact that West Side Story is a modern adaptation of Romeo and Juliet didn't detract from our enjoyment. Instead of the Montagues and the Capulets, we have the uh, Sharks and the Jets. Instead of Romeo and Juliet, we have Tony and Maria. But it's the same story. The authors admitted it was the same story. They brought it up to date. The fact that many details are different, for example, Maria doesn't die in the end, does, doesn't mean it's not cut from the same tale. In fact, it's the differences that prove the point. It's the same with Christianity. In the first century, there was already a huge template, many model stories upon which previous myths had been built. There were dozens of ancient god-men who came down from heaven. They were born of a god and a human female, often a virgin. They performed heroic, miraculous deeds. They were persecuted. They died tragic deaths. They rose from the dead. Many of them ascended into heaven. But in the gospel story, the gospel version of that old tale, the God-man is not called Osiris, or Dionysus, or Annas, or Adonis, or Augustus, or Romulus. His name is changed to Jesus. Different name, same story. In his book, Born Divine, The Births of Jesus and Other Sons of God, Robert Miller documents many miraculous births. Hercules, the Agenes, Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Apollonius of Tyana, Pythagoras. Let's just look at one of those. Caesar Augustus. In the first century BC, there was a resolution in the Provincial Assembly of Asia Minor in honor of Caesar Augustus. Look what it says. Whereas the providence, or whereas God, which has guided our whole existence, and has shown such care and liberality, has brought our life to the peak of perfection in giving to us Augustus Caesar, whom providence filled with virtue, and for the welfare of mankind, being sent to us to our descendants as a savior, Sotir, has put an end to war and has set all things in order. Whereas God, having become visible, and whereas finding that the birthday of the God, Caesar Augustus, has been for the whole world the beginning of the gospel concerning him, therefore let all reckon a new era, beginning from the date of his birth. Here, here he is, he's a savior. He brought peace on earth. He was a God who was made visible. And that phrase, beginning of the gospel, if you read the book of Mark, the first gospel, how does that gospel start? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus. Randall Helms in the book Gospel Fictions tells this story. In the first century of the Common Era, there appeared at the eastern end of the Mediterranean a remarkable religious leader who taught the worship of one true God. He declared that religion meant not the sacrifice of beasts, but the practice of charity and piety and the shunning of hatred and enmity. He was said to have worked miracles of goodness, casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead. His exemplary life led some of his followers to claim he was the Son of God. He called himself the Son of Man. Accused of sedition against Rome, he was arrested. After his death, his disciples claimed he had risen from the dead. He appeared to them alive, and then he ascended up into heaven. 
Who was this teacher and wonder worker? His name was Apollonius of Tyana. Tyana was in Nazareth. And you can read his story. He died about the year 98 AD, the next generation after Christianity. You can read about it in uh, Philostratus' Life of Apollonius. Here is a clear example of a pre-Christian story from which the Jesus story was cut. Romulus, the founder of Rome. Romulus was called the Son of God. He was also called God, King and Father. He was prophesied to be the builder of a great city. He descended from heaven, born of a virgin and the god Mars. He became a god incarnate in order to establish a kingdom on earth. He was murdered by the political elite. Romulus, when he died, darkness covered the earth at his death. The earth shook at his death. His body vanished. He appeared around the break of dawn to a disciple on a road to the city, revealing that he was resurrected. He would ascend back to heaven to rule from on high. Romulus' death and resurrection were celebrated in annual public ceremonies since before Christian times. And these documents predate the Christian documents. In her book, Miracles in Greco-Roman Antiquity, Wendy Cotter documents many pre-Christian gods and heroes who heal. Hercules, Asclepius, Isis, Pythagoras, Empedocles, Pyrrhus, you can read the list. She documents exorcisms and exorcists. Gods and heroes who control nature, Aphrodite, Poseidon, the, the sons of Zeus, and Orpheus and so on. She even gives three examples of Dionysus changing water into wine. The Gospels were not created ex nihilo. Christianity was not delivered by the stork. It had a, it had a parentage. Its most immediate parent was Judaism. But neither was Judaism delivered by the stork. It too had gone through a long history of evolution before the Christians came on the scene. In his book, The River of God, Greg Riley describes how the early Israelites were not monotheistic. They did not have a body-soul dualism. They got that from the Greeks. Nor did they have a Satan. That came from Zoroastrians. As evidence, Riley shows us the well-known contradiction in the Bible between 2 Samuel 24.1 and 1 Chronicles 21.1 both telling the same story about how David was pressured to take a census. In 2 Samuel we read, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. But in 1 Chronicles, the same story says, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So did the Lord make him do it, or did the devil make him do it? The answer to this contradiction is pretty easy. Because it wasn't until the Babylonian captivity, 6th century BC, that the Jews got the idea that God had a near equal adversary who battles for the soul of humanity. While the Jews were in Babylon, Babylon was conquered by the Persian, Cyrus the Great, by the way, whom the Jews called their Messiah, because he allowed them to re return home. When they got back home, they brought along with them a new religious idea, an evil Satan from the Zoroastrians. So now we see why the Bible contradicts itself. 2 Samuel was written before the Babylonian captivity. 1 Chronicles was written after the Babylonian captivity. The Jewish God could be both good and evil, but after coming into contact with Zoroastrianism, the Jews now had someone else to blame. Christianity inherited its devil from Judaism, which we see was cut from an even earlier pagan story. Dennis MacDonald, in his wonderful book, The Homeric Epics, in the Gospel of Mark it makes a strong cumulative case that the author of the first gospel patterned many of the Jesus stories primarily after Judaism, but then after the Odyssey and the Iliad. I was surprised by this wonderful book, and you would love reading this book. Odysseus and Jesus, both were carpenters. MacDonald writes, Odysseus and Jesus both sail the seas with associates who are inferior, who weaken when confronted with suffering. Both heroes return home to find it infested with murderous rivals that devour the houses of widows. Both oppose supernatural foes. They visit dead heroes. They prophesy their own returns in the third person. A wise woman anoints each protagonist. Both eat last suppers with their comrades before visiting Hades, from which both return alive. In both works, we find God stilling the storms and walking on water, meals for thousands at the shore, monsters in caves. And of course, the Odyssey was many centuries before Christianity. Here's one example, the sleeping sailors. I wish I could show you all these examples, but this is amazing. Odysseus' crew boarded and sat down. In Mark 4, we have the story where Jesus boarded the boat and sat down to teach. On a floating island, Odysseus told stories to Aeolus. On a floating boat, Jesus told stories to crowds. After a month, he took his leave, boarded, and sailed with 12 ships. 
When it was late, Jesus took his leave and sailed with other boats. Odysseus slept, Jesus slept at the stern. The greedy crew opened the sack of wind and created a storm. And there was a great gale of wind in the gospel. The crew groaned. The disciples were helpless and afraid. Odysseus awoke and gave up hope. But Jesus, Mark's improving the story, Jesus awoke and stilled the storm. Odysseus complained of his crew's folly. Jesus rebuked his disciples for lack of faith. Aeolus was the master of the winds. Jesus was the master of the seas. I wish I had time to read this whole parallel. This is incredible. The next chapter, Mark 5, about the demoniac of the Gerasenes, how point by point by point, even with the exact kinds of words and the phrasings, and turns of phrase, uh, the Cyclops and the demoniac, who both lived in caves, are compared. Obviously, Mark was familiar with the, of Homer's work. The Sons of Thunder, in Mark chapter 3, we see where Jesus picked his disciples. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. He liked to give him names, I guess. James, the son of Zebedee and the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges. You know what that word means, Boanerges? Well, he translates it for us, the sons of thunder. These two twins, these guys who have one name for two guys, and they usually always speak in one voice, James and John, uh, are amazingly parallel to Homer's Castor and Polydeuces. The, their, Castor was, and Polydeuces were called the sons of Tyndarus. James and John were the sons of Zebedee. They were also given another name. They were called the Dioscuri, the sons of Zeus. The Boanerges, uh, the sons of Zebedee, were given the name Boanerges, sons of thunder. Of course, Zeus was the god of thunder. Mark is copying or, or emulating the story here. They were twin brothers who spoke with one voice. They were Argonauts, sailors, or fishermen and sailors. Castor died a violent death. James died a violent death, not this James. Polydeuces could have lived forever. John was thought to live until the parousia. Polydeuces asked Zeus if he and Castor could share a single immortality. Remember on the Transfiguration, the brothers asked if they could sit at Jesus' right hand and left hand? Zeus consented, but Jesus refused. Here's another amazing parallel, and if we want to come back and look at this, the deaths of Agamemnon and John the Baptist over a sexual affair and the, and the killing during a party, and this whole thing that just goes point by point by point. A fascinating parallel here is that in the book of Mark, we have two stories of the feeding of the multitude. The first one's in Mark 6, the other one's in Mark 8. In the Odyssey, we also have two stories of the feeding of the multitude. Look at this first one. Telemachus and Athena sailed and disembarked. Disembarked. Jesus and his disciples sailed and disembarked. They found a great crowd on the shore. They found a great crowd on the shore. 4,500 men. Well, Mark increases it to 5,000 men. Everyone sat down in companies, nine groups of 500 each. But Mark had to say everyone sat down in companies, and he had to make it by ranks. He had to do the math differently of 150s. Pesistratus ordered the guests to sit. Jesus ordered the people to sit. Nestor sacrificed, and others prayed. Jesus offered thanks to God. They took the meat and divided the food. Jesus took the loaves and fish and divided them. Everyone ate and was filled in both stories. I have to skip the second feeding, but it's also quite similar in parallel to it. Now, MacDonald admits, and so do I, that any one of these hundreds of details might be accidental parallels, perhaps similar ways of telling similar stories. But since there are literally hundreds of details, usually in the same order, and dozens of similar stories, often with two parallel stories followed immediately by another two parallel stories in the same order, or close to the same order, the cumulative case for emulation becomes too strong for historians to ignore. Historians work in probabilities, and the likelihood that all of these coincidences are just accidental becomes so tiny, it is virtually zero. Mark was emulating Homer. Now, the stories don't have to be exact to be seen as emulations. You know, Roman and Juliet, West Side Story, or The Odyssey and, uh, and Jesus, or those two stories. Pythagoras. Pythagoras was a Greek. He came up with the fish symbol. You take two circles and you put them together, it's hard to see there. And, this, and then the middle section becomes the sign of the fish, where those two symbols interact, uh, intersect. And Pythagoras worked out the ratio of the width to the height, which is the closest approximation they could get at that time. One, 265 to 153, those became mystery numbers. They didn't reveal those mystery numbers. Pythagoras believed that numbers were special and mysterious. There's a story, he called it the measure of the fish. There's a story that when Pythagoras was journeying, he met near the shore with some fishermen. They were drawing their nets, heavily laden with fish from the deep, and he told them that he knew the exact number of fish that was in those nets. And he did tell them that, but he didn't tell the reader. 
In John 21, John, by the way, is the most Gnostic of all the Gospel writers, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and the sons of Zebedee were going fishing. They immediately entered a ship, and they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you'll find it. They cast, and they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fish. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes. How many fish were there that they caught? John tells us 153 fish. The measure of the fish. John is obviously putting mystery numbers and things that his readers of his day would have known. I also read some Christian authors. Jack Finnegan, I think he's an evangelical fundamentalist. Myth and mystery in the background of the Gospels. I also read Everett Ferguson's huge book. Um, I have it here. On um, the... Uh, background, the uh, mythological background of Christianity. Ferguson is a strong believer. He, he, he strongly believes in faith in Jesus. But on the last page of his book, he has this two-page section, the final payoff. What was unique in Christianity? We finally get to the end of this book. Romans, the Greeks, the Zoroastrians, the uh, Canaanites, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, and so on. What was unique in Christianity? Ferguson cannot name one single thing after he surveys all this history. What he does is he says, that Christian claims don't rest on its originality but or on its uniqueness. He says, in order for Christianity to be true, we have to pass from history to faith. Now, it's not just modern scholars, but even early Christians. In the second century, there was a Christian apologist who had been a pagan believer who converted to Christianity, Justin Martyr. And he was arguing with the pagans about, you should all convert to Christianity. You know why? Because it's no different. Look what he says. When we say also that the Word, who was the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union, and that He, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was crucified and, and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you, pagans, believe regarding those whom you esteem to be the sons of Jupiter. Like Mercury, Jesus is the Logos. Like Perseus, He was born of a virgin. Like Escalator, if early Christians claimed that the Jesus story was nothing different from paganism. Who am I to disagree? Because that's what I have presented to people. I cannot believe that there would ever be an objection. 
uh, to my citation of your own book. I, I, I can't imagine. Did you address this subject in your book? Is there not an entire section on this subject? Yes, but you okay. don't know that I may have changed my mind in the meantime on that, so it's unfair. I may have, I may have changed my mind about Mithra, for example. Is, is, your, is your book for sale in the back? Yes, it is, but we're not how debating can we have a, tonight. How can we have a debate? Let's debate the issues. Let's not debate yes. my book. Let's debate the issues. Uh, Mr. I Mr. Debate Barker, your book. Mr. Barker, I have on the screen quotations from you. I'm going to be dealing with the sources that you used and the arguments that you've used. That is the form of scholarly debate. But we are I not believe that I'm you sorry, have but we are not debating my book tonight. And I think he's out of line in it. And for the record, I think it's inappropriate. I didn't quote anything you wrote. I've stuck to the actual. That's the point. That's the problem. We, we, we need to deal with what someone has actually put into the public realm. Your book is for sale. Um, I, I cannot believe on any uh, possible uh, academic or scholarly level. I, I have done more debates than you've done. This is the first time anyone has ever objected to the citation of their own published material, which is still in print. If you had pulled it out and repudiated it, that would be one thing. Are you going to do that? The moderator has already spoken. All right. I think it's reasonable, then, to, to use a source that is available on, on the topic, isn't it, in your mind? If there's something out there, whether it's well, quality or not. This, this is a presentation that I've put together, and, if, and Dan has, has given his objection uh, to quoting him. Uh, I'm sorry, but I do not see how you can have a meaningful dialogue on this subject if what the person himself has put into the public realm is, is not available. I would just like to say, uh, before I begin my time again and my presentation, uh, that I would be honored if people would quote my books, uh, especially when I address the specific topic of the debate. That shows that you have done your homework in listening to what the other person has to say. And if I put something in print, if I change my mind, I'm going to let people know and I'm going to pull it out of print. Uh, so I think that's just simply the way it needs to go. So can I make my presentation now? Okay, thank you very much. All right, we continue on. Uh, Dan has written uh, in his book, Godless, which is available in the back, so you can check the references. I am now convinced that the Jesus story is a combination of myth and legend mixed with a little bit of real history unrelated to Jesus. And he presented four arguments in his book on this foundation. He said that there is no external historical confirmation for the New Testament stories. Secondly, that the New Testament stories are internally contradictory. Third, and this is the main subject of our debate, that there are natural explanations for the origin of the Jesus legend. And finally, the miracle reports make the story unhistorical, that is, the presence of the supernatural in the gospel stories make it an unhistorical source. Now, I need to address each one of these arguments, but I want to focus primarily on number three. The first argument is that there is no external historical confirmation for the New Testament stories. Now, this requires an amazingly biased view of history itself. The New Testament gospels, acts, many of the epistles such uh, are unlike such works as the Book of Mormon, because the New Testament Gospels, Acts, and Epistles are filled with rich historical detail, both geographically and politically. That is, they give us information from the first century, demonstrate that these writings came from that particular time period. At one point, Mr. Barker comments on uh, manuscript Ryland 457, better known as P52, from John chapter 18, dated to AD 100 to AD 125. And he makes reference to this and says, There is no way to verify from these few verses whether the rest of John or any of the remainder of the New Testament is reliable. The numbers are to the page references in the book Godless. Now let's think about this for just a moment. Surely on the level of reliability, as far as historic accuracy or honesty goes, no manuscript is even relevant to such an inquiry. However, what P52 does tell us is that John, as the Gospel of John, in the form in which we have it today, existed in the first decade of the second century, which puts its initial writing well into the first century. It, is like, it likewise tells us that the manuscript tradition we have is, in fact, very reliable. The second argument that was presented is the New Testament stories are internally contradictory. Now, Mr. Barker's work provides no interaction with serious scholarly works offering consistent, sound, exegetically insightful discussions of any of the alleged contradictions that he offers. Here are some examples provided from the book. On page 265, Dan writes, 
Even Paul's supposed confirmation of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8, contradicts the Gospels when it says that Jesus first was seen of Cephas, that is Peter, then of the twelve. Notice the insertion of the word first into Dan's sentence. It is not a quote from the Bible. Paul did not say Peter was the first seen, was first seen by Jesus. And there isn't the first logical reason why anyone would assume that a brief creedal summary was being given as an exhaustive list of all the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection in chronological order. Paul's statement, coming as most critical scholars admit from within the first few years after Jesus' crucifixion, is still not earlier than the gospel stories themselves, well known to all who would be reading Paul. So it is Dan who is creating, out of whole cloth, a contradiction that nowhere exists in any semi-reasonable reading of the text. This is a hallmark of much of what you see in atheist writings on the Bible today. Dennis McKenzie is especially an example of that. Here's another example. Barker notes Luke's mention of Quirinius as governor of Syria, yet he shows no familiarity with any of the scholarly discussion of the translation of Prote, issues relating to our lack of knowledge of the political situation at the time, etc. The reality is that there are a number of perfectly fair, historically sound explanations for Luke's statement, none of which gets a fair hearing in the discussion that was provided. But the focus is upon the third argument. There are natural explanations for the origin of the Jesus legend. Now at this point, Mr. Barker lists eight different natural explanations of the Jesus legend. I would say with the presentation he just made, that's now at least 16 to 20. It is important to point out that each of these explanations, and this will be true with what he added, is completely contradictory to the other seven. That is, if any one is true, the other seven are false. Consider the consistency of this kind of argumentation. When you add in the other option, that is, that Jesus existed and that the New Testament documents were more than sufficient to demonstrate this, that's a total of nine options, just in his book, all completely contradictory to the others, meaning any single one in Mr. Barker's offering has an 11% chance of being correct. And now with the presentation this morning, that number is about half of that. Is that the kind of solid historical argumentation that can carry the day? Now, a debate is not the proper context for the foundational discussion of how to do serious historical inquiry and thinking. However, it must be stated that the vast majority of material flowing from Prometheus books, the Jesus Seminar, Bajans, and other proponents of either a Jesus mythology or a Gnostic Jesus theory comprises a mythology all unto itself. Through selective use of facts and horribly imbalanced application of context, an entire cottage industry has appeared over the past few decades. An industry that makes its living through anti-Christian propaganda. Ignoring counter-evidence to volumes of sound historical scholarship standing in opposition to their conclusions. These writers pursue a single goal, the denial of the Christian message. Double standards abound as these writers draw parallels that are totally unfounded on any serious historical basis. We will unfortunately see many examples of this in our examination today. Now, any fair examination of the New Testament documents demonstrates the following. First of all, they are consistent with the context of Second Temple Judaism in the first part of the first century. Secondly, they demonstrate a clear first-hand knowledge of Judea and Galilee in the same period. And thirdly, they present a consistent testimony to the Jewish Messiah prophesied in the Tanakh, that is, in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, some of the naturalistic arguments listed by Mr. Barker are barely worth, worthy of note, such as the pre-Christian Joshua cult theory, which was utterly unsubstantiated, or the Old Testament parallels theory, which was likewise left utterly unsubstantiated. But the third possible source for the Jesus legend is very popular amongst atheists today, a compilation of various and divergent pagan mythologies, such as those of Attis, Dionysus, Osiris, and most important, the Persian religion of Mithraism. Now, the number of reasons that has led serious critical scholarship to reject this kind of parallelomania is so great that we cannot even begin to list them all in 20 minutes of time. We can only summarize in general and give a few specifics in reference to Mithraism. First, these sources regularly use Christian language to describe pagan beliefs and then feign amazement at the result of parallels. Witness, for example, the assertion that Dionysus was virgin-born. He was actually, in most versions of the story, sewn into Zeus's thigh and born from there after his mother was killed. That's not quite a virgin birth in the biblical sense. 
Or the common statement that Osiris experienced a baptism when in fact his coffin was thrown in the Nile. Or that Osiris was resurrected when in fact his dismembered body was put back together so he could become the zombified lord of the underworld. None of these pagan myths have any logical or meaningful connection to Christian beliefs about resurrection, the afterlife, baptism, or salvation. We must also note the fundamental difference between the monotheistic Judaism that forms the background of Christian belief and the polytheistic mythology of pagan beliefs. The Christian faith is based upon a firm assertion that the events of Jesus' life took place in history at a particular time and a particular place. Pagan mythology did not ground its stories in history at all. An extended citation providing alleged parallels to Mithraism is provided by Mr. Barker on pages 270 and 271 of Godless, drawn from this work, The Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets by Barbara Walker. Mr. Barker identifies Barbara Walker as a historian, when in reality her only schooling, as far as I've been able to determine, is in journalism. The majority of her published works are on knitting. She is an atheist feminist, but as we are about to see, her willingness to distort historical facts and present historical fiction is simply astounding. A brief scan of other portions of this work reveal incredible errors of fact and representation, errors utterly beyond defense. The work is grossly anti-Christian, biased, and as a work of history, completely worthless. Here are some examples of fallacious historical argumentation from Godless by Dan Barker, even though in this first number he's quoting from Barbara Walker. Quote, Mithra was born on the 25th of December, which was finally taken over by Christians in the 4th century as the birthday of Christ. Now, the date of the birth of Christ is not a part of the Christian scriptures. The reality is that January 6th was discussed earlier than December 25th, and what is more, Mithraism coming into the Roman Empire in the 2nd century arrives too late to be relevant to the formation of Christianity. This has been known and documented for nearly a century. What is more, there is much dispute as to who borrowed from whom at this point, as there is reason to identify uh, Christian discussion on December 25th prior to the earliest Mithraic references. What is more likely, what is more likely, that Mithraism borrowed from the rising Christian religion, or that Christianity borrowed from the dying Mithraic religion? I would direct you to Roger Beckwith's uh, fine discussion of the date of uh, Christ's birth for a meaningful and poor, uh, historical insight that is free of the rhetoric that is so often found in internet discussions of this particular topic. We continue, before returning to heaven, Mithra celebrated a last supper with his twelve disciples who represented the twelve signs of the zodiac. In memory of this, his worshippers partook of the sacramental meal of bread marked with the cross. This was one of seven Mithraic sacraments, the models of the Christian's seven sacraments. Now, Mithra did not have 12 disciples. Note the purposeful use of Christian language. The signs of the zodiac are hardly relevant to the named disciples from known cities in first century Israel. When was the Mithraic ceremony called a last supper by Mithraists themselves? We are not told. The meal, common in almost all religions around the world, was in memory of Mithra's slaying of the bull and would often be done on a table spread with the skin of such an animal. There is nothing regarding sacrifice, atonement, eternal life, or anything else relevant to the Christian faith. Remember, Christians were celebrating the supper a century before Mithraism came into Roman society, and anyone suggesting such a parallel should be ready to prove that Mithraism was not only known in Jerusalem in the early first century, but that it was uh, people were practicing these things and was popular enough to provide a basis for Christians borrowing their concepts. These were not called sacraments, as far as anyone uh, can see, nor have I found any foundation for the assertion that the bread was marked by a cross, as irrelevant as that would be, as primitive Christian celebrations did not have such items themselves. Further, the concept of seven sacraments developed in Roman Catholicism centuries and centuries later, making this blatant example of parallelomania particularly useful in identifying bad, very bad, argumentation. The text continued to say it, the supper was called Miz, Latin Missa, English Mass. Mithra's image was buried in a rock tomb. He was withdrawn from it and said to live again. The actual origination of the term Mass comes from the Latin Missa. Catechumens were dismissed from the worship at a particular point before the celebration of the supper, and this led eventually to the use of the term, Latin term Mass uh, for that which took place after the catechumens left. Mithraic scholarship knows nothing of a death or resurrection for Mithra, and again, Barker's source, Barbara Walker, is seen to be creating parallels where none exist in truth and reality. Continuing, like early Christianity, Mithraism was an ascetic anti-female religion. 
Its priesthood consisted of celibate men only, page 271. The Mithraism was primarily attractive to those in the military, and as such was ill-suited to provide a foundation for the creation of Christianity, even if it had been prevalent in first century Palestine, which, of course, it was not. Further, it is simply absurd on its face to say early Christianity was an anti-female religion, since it was Christianity that taught that there is neither male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. Further, the concept of a celibate priesthood developed long after the New Testament period, once again demonstrating how historically untenable are the assertions that are being reproduced here. Then we're told the Christian notion of salvation was almost wholly a product of this Persian eschatology adopted by Semitic Aramites and some cultists like the Essenes and by Roman military men who thought the rigid discipline and vivid battle imagery Mithraism appropriate for warriors. Such a statement expresses an astounding ignorance of the Christian notion of salvation, let alone the makeup of the early Christian movement, which was primarily made up not of Semitic Aramites and some cultists, let alone Roman soldiers, but slaves and lower class people in Roman society. And again, at a time when Mithraism had yet to make its entrance into Roman society. To anyone with an even fair familiarity with the historical sources, this kind of argumentation would be humorous if it was not being presented as being serious by Barbara Walker. Then Mr. Barker himself writes, the name Mary is common to names given to mothers of other gods. The Syrian Mira, the Greek Maya, and the Hindu Maya all derive from the familiar Ma for mother. Now, is this relevant to the name of Mary, wife of Joseph, and mother of Jesus? Just a few years ago, Richard Balcom published a groundbreaking study that has sent shockwaves across the field of New Testament studies, titled Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Apart from his arguing that at least one of the Gospels is, in fact, eyewitness testimony, he likewise included a study of the most common names in Israel derived from archaeological digs in the centuries immediately prior to and after the time of Christ. And guess what the most common female name was? You guessed it, Mary. So which is more likely, that the Gospels are reflecting the historical reality, or that there is some pagan mythology at play? Instead of this kind of parallelomania, we should listen carefully to sober scholarship on this topic, such as that provided by Gary Lees, who has written, quote, After almost 100 years of unremitting labor, the conclusion appears inescapable that neither Mithraism nor Christianity proved to be an obvious and direct influence upon the other in the development and demise or survival of either religion. Their beliefs and practices are well accounted for by their most obvious origins, and there is no need to explain one in terms of the other. And so, if I were to take the time to examine each of the popularly promoted sources for Jesus, including the Osiris myths, or Greek stories like Attis or Dionysus, or those who promote Gnostic myths, etc., we would find the same kind of constant anachronism and factual misstatements that we have documented here regarding Mithraism. Indeed, as the serious historian Trig V. Medinger has put in his conclusion of his work, The Riddle of Resurrection, Dying and Rising Gods in the Ancient Near East, quote, The death of Jesus is presented in the sources as vicarious suffering, as an act of atonement for sins. But there is no evidence of the death or dying of ri and rising of gods as vicarious suffering for sins. There is, as far as I am aware, no prima facie evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct, drawing on the myths and rites of the dying and rising gods of the surrounding world. The faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus retains its unique character in the history of religions." End quote. Like the fiction of Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, those who ignore the fundamental realities of history, the vast chasm of difference between the historically grounded story of Jesus and Nazareth, and the ahistorical mythology of Mithra, or Osiris, or Dionysus, or Romulus, can only offer us fantasies rather than the truth. There is only one logical context for the story of Jesus, the very one offered in the Bible, that of the Jewish people of the first century who, like Simeon and Anna in the temple, looked for the promised Messiah while rejecting and detesting the paganism of the world around them. Finally, argument number four. The miracle reports make the story unhistorical. This is truly the foundation of Dan's position. For in essence, here again, we have the overriding power of his naturalist, materialistic worldview coming to the fore. His argument is simple. There is no supernatural realm, hence any source, even referencing it, must be, quote, unhistorical, end quote. This is circular reasoning, begging the question, assuming the end of the debate before you have proven your point. I refer you to the debate between myself and Mr. Barber from late April of this year. Uh, for further discussion of whether naturalistic materialism can provide a consistent ground for human thought 
and predication. For now, let me point you to a single miracle that is recorded in the Gospels to see if you would agree with Mr. Barker's position. In Luke chapter 17, uh, verses 11 through 19, we have the healing of the ten lepers. It takes place on the border between Galilee and Samaria, which was a place of racial tension and arrogance. The Jews detested the Samaritans, the Samaritans returned the favor. The miracle is rooted in history. To even understand it, you have to know what was going on in first century Palestine. It is a purposeful miracle, speaking directly not only the need of men, but the situation in that day, a situation that changed only 40 years later. So this narrative had to come from that time period when people would have understood this context. The entire story lives and breathes the original historical context. It does not breathe the air of mythology in any way, shape, or form. And so we conclude, there is no reason to look for a mythological foundation for Jesus. The historical realities of the Jewish people at the beginning of the first century, together with the Jewish scriptures and their prophetic witness, are more than sufficient foundation for the gospel stories. The story of Jesus is unique because he, as the incarnate one, was himself truly unique. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, Mr. Barker, you now have 10 minutes for cross-examination. We take this first cross X really for informational right. purpose. Yes. Right. Right. I wasn't going to do So, uh, I don't remember, did you find the word pagan? Uh, no, I did not define the word pagan. Did you, would you like me to? Yeah. Well, as I was using it there, I was referring to uh, religions that are primarily focused upon uh, celebration of nature, fertility, uh, the vegetation cycle, hence uh, uh, would have holidays specifically associated with spring, uh, fall, uh, those uh, issues along those lines. Isn't it true the word pagan really just means not Christian? Any religion that's outside of the Judeo-Christian realm, whatever they're going I think that would be an anachronistic use of the term prior to Christianity, obviously. Uh, I would imagine a lot of Christians use it that way, but I was referring to its use in history of religion studies. So if there were any believers who were not basing their beliefs on natural, cyclical things, but they had some kind of spiritual knowledge of God, you would not call that a non-Christian, non-pagan religion. What would it be? Uh, You're talking about after the beginning of Christianity? No, before and during. I wouldn't use the term Christian of anything prior to Christ, obviously, that, that was Judaism, but uh, there were obviously all sorts of religions that were focused upon the vegetation cycle, which was the means by which anyone was, stayed alive in those days. Had a good crop, you'd live. Had a good crop, you might not make it. Uh, that would be a, a pagan religion because it's focused upon the creation rather than upon the creator. So Pythagoras' worship of numbers would not be pagan then? Uh, since the numbers are a part of creation itself, you could, if you want to use that terminology, uh, I don't know if the term pagan is defined in the Bible, so it's not a, a hill I'm interested in dying on. Well, in my, my reading, a pagan basically is anybody who's not a Christian, anybody who's outside the circle. And uh, you don't consider pagan to be a bad word, do you? It's not a pejorative, it's just a description. It's a, it's a descriptive term, sure. I mean, it, it can be used in that way. I mean, uh, sometimes you look at somebody and say, you're pagan. Uh, but you're, you're normally, you know, well, normally some of us, using that not in a specific uh, scholarly sense. That some of us would be proud of the words, you know, because, uh, well, that's a different part of the debate. Uh, I'm sure you agree, and you alluded to the fact that later Christians did borrow from paganism, especially after Constantine, um, and, you know, in their church constructions and in their practices and in their mass and in their clergy and in their vestments and in all, and in, you know, a lot of these things that church did basically borrow from paganism, from Romans and from the Greeks. And you do admit that within the Christian church, I don't know. Well, I have to answer, I haven't finished the question yet, because that, that's preparing the question. Um, the, uh, in, in that admission, I think you agree then, therefore, that 
some parts of the Christian church have exhibited a propensity then to borrow from outside sources to flavor their religion. Uh, I, would want, I would then ask you, what is it that makes the first century Christians exempt from that proclivity? A couple things. Uh, I, I don't agree with the, the first two complex foundational statements in the sense that medieval Roman Catholicism, uh, especially once it established infant baptism as a means of entering the church, uh, brought all sorts of pagans in, and so you had an assimilation of various and sundry uh, pagan elements within medieval Roman Catholicism. Uh, there is a vast difference between the practice of something five or six hundred years at the time of Christ and that of the apostles who are living in Judea uh, prior to AD 70 and are living in a Jewish context uh, where paganism, uh, the pagan religions of the day, uh, are considered to be uh, completely anathema and uh, hence to try to build a religion by borrowing from the very religions that people you're tempted to reach find to be reprehensible or repulsive has never made any sense to me. So that's how I answered the, the main question, that is, why is the first century um, uh, precluded from what happened later on, uh, is you have a completely different context uh, for the apostles than you have for fifth century uh, medieval Catholicism after the fall of uh, the western portion of the Roman Empire. Isn't it true that all religions consider the others to be anathema in some way? No, not at all. In fact, uh, a large number of the mystery religions of the days, in fact, that was one of the things that the Jews were so hated for, was there's a tremendous amount of eclecticism in the mystery religions. Uh, if you were a follower of Dionysus, that didn't mean that someone who was a follower of Mithra was wrong. So, no, that would not be uh, a case in any serious study of the history of religions at all. You were allowed to be a member of multiple of the mystery religions. In the first century, I'm sure you agree that whoever wrote those Gospels would have or should have been familiar with earlier stories of heroes and gods who had had virgin births. There were stories floating around at the time, right, of gods and heroes who were born of a virgin. The primary sources uh, that have been identified by scholarship of the New Testament documents primarily come from the Jewish people themselves. Uh, the primary references are to be found in what we would call the apocryphal works today, the New Testamental period. Maccabees, works like that. Uh, Paul is aware of Greek philosophy and Greek philosophers and stories along those lines. Uh, but uh, there would be entire sections of especially uh, Roman religion that would only be known by having discussion with uh, uh, maybe soldiers uh, that, that came in from Rome, even though the Roman cohorts in Palestine initially generally were not uh, of the legion level. They were not uh, Italian, and hence might not even have knowledge of that. So uh, a, a someone like Peter uh, would have an extremely limited uh, exposure to uh, many of the sources that you were uh, presenting here. He lived in Galilee, and that's quite a cosmopolitan crossroads where a clash of many cultures, many religions were in existence. Are, are you suggesting that the people who wrote the New Testament were ignorant of the story of Romulus and this, the stories of the previous, you do agree there were pre-existing stories of virgin birth. Right, whether the Christians knew of them or not. There were right? pre-existing stories of gods in human form impregnating women. Uh, I am not aware of any story from monotheism where a child is conceived without the means of a physical god. If you are, please let us know in advance. Romulus uh, was impregnated, the versatile vegetable was impregnated by Mars, who was this whatever kind of a creature. And whatever happened to the virgin birth of Jesus, um, by the way, was there historical witness to the virgin birth of Jesus, to the virgin uh, conception of Jesus? How could you have a historical witness? To exactly. Somebody? How could you have a historical witness to Romulus, right, or to Caesar Augustus? There's no way you would know that historically. So at yeah. le le least it's outside the, the people that were involved. Yeah. So at least isn't the claim of a virgin birth uh, a non-historical claim? It's just a claim that somebody made that can't be verified. Well, if you, if you assert that history has to be uh, naturalistic and ignore any activity of God in history, uh, then certainly you, that's, that's the conclusion. Well, where's the historical on. nexus there? Where is the historical source or document or testimony of the fact that this virgin got impregnated by a ghost? Where's that? Uh, well, of course, not a ghost spirit, but... Uh, Holy ghost. Uh, yeah, but as you know, that's not the proper translation of Numa. But uh, that would 
be due to the fact that the, uh, that the writer Luke specifically makes reference to checking his sources, doing interviews, and writing during the lifetime, having interviewed the people that he is writing the story of. That's about as close as you can get to a original historical source, as, as I'm familiar with. So he talked to somebody who saw Mary get pregnant? No, he talked to Mary. Oh, and Mary saw herself get pregnant by this experience. Uh, again, I, I, think, I think the line of question here is, is self-evidently um, presupposing a naturalistic worldview that uh, you bet. not providing foundation. You bet the naturalistic worldview is the only viable worldview, by the way. Is that a question? Do you believe that the uh, Egyptian sorcerers actually turned sticks into snakes? Yes. They did? Yes. By what power? Uh, there is more than one supernatural power in the world. So the devil, they actually performed. So they had that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the evidences that your Zoroastrian uh, assertions are, are completely out of line with the Old Testament. Yeah. I only made one Zoroastrian assertion. Well, one's enough. <laughs> Cyrus the Great, I um, should be cross-examining, just cross-examining, do we yes. still have time here? 46 hours. Um, how long has the human race existed? I do not have any idea, if that's not a part of my revelation. Unless you're going yeah. he knows exactly, but I don't know. Well, in your best guess, how old is the human race? How long have we been here? I, I, I do not know. There's uh, estimates anywhere from, if, if you're talking about from the time of Adam on, uh, there are various ways of uh, working the genealogies that would go anywhere from uh, 6 to uh, 20,000 years. 6 to 20,000 years, the human species? You're on record saying... No, no, I didn't say this. Uh, the human race, the human I species. I said from Adam, however you determine who Adam was. There are people who would say that, that uh, Adam is the first creature that is created. There are other people that would say that, uh, that Adam came to the point of just just saying from Adam onward, because that's the only biblical revelation. Were there humans before Adam? Our time is Our time is up. Uh, there'll be a five minute break to stretch your legs, and then we'll, we'll continue after that. Uh, every educated writer of Greek in those days was familiar. School children were familiar. 
Homer, the Odyssey, the Iliad were used pretty much like tutorials to learn how to write. The Romans copied and emulated uh, Homer, the Greeks copied and emulated Homer. Homer was sort of the Shakespeare of the day. And Mark, as I said earlier, patterned most of his gospel after the Jewish scriptures, obviously. But he did take many stories, not all of them, but many of his actual supposed historical tales within the book of Mark, and he emulated, just like I emulated the Three Little Pigs, he emulated Homer, although you can see that he tried to improve it, he tried to change it, he tried to say our Jesus is even better than Odysseus. So, yes, it's the claim that, the, you're exactly right, much of the book of Mark was deliberately emulating Homer. You also said the Christian story was clearly cut from the Romulus story. Is that uh, not what you said? I didn't say it was clearly cut from that story. I'm saying that that story is part of the fabric from which the Jesus story was cut. Romulus is one example of many examples of virgin-born sons of God who were saviors, who were prophesied and persecuted, and so on. And so, uh, you know, we can't connect the, the dots exactly between Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and the story of Romulus, but we can show the fabric, the texture from which the culture of the day, the, the readers of his day would have known and understood. Anybody who was anybody in those days, if you're going to create a new religion, you better have elements in it that have virgin verses, it's, and one or two childhood stories of how magnificent he was, and miracles, and, and demons, and you got to do stuff like that, so stealing the waves, and you, you got to show that your God is really a real God, and that's how you do it. So in first century Palestine, amongst the Jews, um, the Jews had uh, access to all of these myths, and Mark was uh, purposely attempting to start a new religion amongst the Jews by referring to those religions that the Jews detested. Not all the Jews had access to all of the myths, but any literate Jew who could compose something like the Book of Mark, which is quite a work of art, actually, when you think about it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Those types of Jews and Greek writers would have been familiar with Homer. And no, he was, he had already believed. In fact, I, I think it's possible that Mark already believed in Jesus and didn't just manufacture it. But what he was doing was, in order to tell the story, he brought these earlier legends in. He brought these earlier epics in to say, look at our, our you know, Jesus, he probably believed Jesus was a real person. But look at, he did this. He outdid Odysseus. He outdid Homer. He did better than Romulus. See, he was bringing these stories in. He's, he's writing historical fiction, creative work of art type of fiction to tell his story, to, to convince the, the readers of his day that our God is, is, is part of the crowd too. You know, you can't, our God is just as good as any of the others. So he's getting monotheists who have been willing to die in their opposition to these religions to adopt a new religion by drawing from the religions that they detest. Well, the only reasons we might think that these monotheists were willing to die for the new religion is because of writers like Mark, who start to tell us those stories. Because before Mark, we had no gospel of Jesus. Before no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I must, have, I must have confused you. What I meant was, it's very clear that the Jewish people, from intertestamental sources prior to Mark, uh, rejected these religions and found them to be uh, reprehensible and, and repulsive. So I'm referring to... Mark comes on the scene in that context. He's trying to create a new religion, and so he draws from the very sources that the people he's trying to convert find to be repulsive to create a new religion to attract them. Well, Christianity started somehow, and it was one of those bold moves, some kind of creative, bold move that those writers, I don't know if Mark thought his gospel was gonna become some bestseller like it is. He was writing the story his own way. Later writers, Matthew and Luke, of course you know, patterned much of their gospels after Mark. So uh, I don't know if we can say that the author of Mark was thinking about Christianity the same way we are here today. I'm uh, a little confused at your presentation because it, it does seem that you have uh, fundamentally changed some of your positions, so I need to ask a question here. You said in your published work that um, there was no tribe of Christians during Josephus' time. Christianity did not get off the ground until the second century. Do you, uh, have you abandoned that assertion? No, I haven't. In the first century, the word Christian and Christianity, historically, was, uh, was not really what you would call a tribe of Christians. But I think that was Suetonius, though. I made that in reference to Suetonius in the year 112, not Josephus. Uh, no, this, is, this is actually talking about uh, 
I just see but, but, uh, so, but you do recognize that there were Christians in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Yeah, they were, they were Jewish Christians. Yeah, they were Jews who thought their Messiah had come. In Rome as well? I don't think in Rome, not, in, not that early, not at the time when, um, um, no, I don't think so. I don't think there was a tribe of Christians in Rome that early in the first century. So who was, who was Paul writing to around 51 in Rome? He might have been writing to some people, but certainly uh, uh, referencing that. The thing about Rome is Josephus. The thing about Rome is a Suetonius, right? Suetonius in his 12 Caesars was talking about how Nero had to.